Welcome to This Week in Hearing, everybody. This is Brian Taylor. And with me this week is Dr. Nicholas Reed. Nicholas is a professor at John Hopkins University School of Medicine, a professor of epidemiology, even though uh, by training, uh, you're an audiologist, I believe, Nick, right? Yeah, yeah. And you're also on the faculty of the uh, Cochlear Center uh, for, uh, what is it, for hearing and public health. Yep. Uh, And uh, last time I checked on PubMed, you were the author or co-author of about 50 to 70 articles. So you're a prolific uh, researcher and writer, and you bring a lot of great value to the table, I think, for all clinicians. And that's really what I want to focus on today with you. First, I want to welcome you to our our webcast. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. (laughs) I'm a big fan so far. Yeah, no, this is our, a unique format. Um, I thought a good place to start would be just to kind of overview. Uh, we don't see a lot of uh, professors of epidemiology that have an AUD. You're probably the only one. Maybe talk a little bit about your journey uh, t- to being in that position. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. I guess I should also just say I'm an assistant professor. You know, there's assistant associate oh. pool. I don't want any of the full professors out there to be like, this guy's... You know, <laughs> no, I forgot about that. Right? No, it's no worries. I don't think anyone would notice. Yeah, so I... You're right. It is rare. I, I, you know, we were opining earlier about how I, I feel like I'm on an island sometimes, but in a weird way, it's not, it's not all completely rare because, you know, there's other clinical fields, physicians being the primary one um, and various medical professions, um, subspecialties that are professors or tenure track per, uh, faculty in departments of epidemiology all over the country. I think the difference was just audiology hadn't seen as much breakthrough of the silos of people going over to that side. And, and for me, you know, it's a sort of a very personal journey in that I I had no intention to fall into this level. I did a T35 experience at the NCRAR in Portland, and I was with Don Conrad Martin and Marilyn Dilly. And, you know, the work was sort of quasi public healthy. It was a matched cohort of veterans looking at diabetes and hearing loss. And they had me present that at a AAS meeting. And I just happened to get next to Frank Lynn and I walked him through my poster and then he walked me through his. And then he was like, do you like this? And I I was like, yeah. And he was like, I don't meet a lot of people that care about this. And this is, this is like 2013 or 2014. So it's several years Mm -hmm. ago. We're in the back corner of the conference and there were like three posters under the epidemiology umbrella. And Frank, uh, he literally said before the conference ended, we had, we had a beer or something. And he was like, you're going to come work in my lab after you finish. And I was like, okay. Cause I was like a third year. So I, I was like, oh yeah, he's not going to remember me. And then we stayed in touch and he brought me in and I worked on the achieve pilot, which we'll talk about that achieve study today. But, you know, I just fell in love with it. I, I saw quickly that we can do something when we look at things on the population level that we can't do when we look at individuals. Um, and we can see things that aren't always clear to us, see trends. And I just think, uh, I find this to be a fascinating area. And I think it's where it's where we can make a difference. And I think you're seeing that right now with, I mean, you talk about this all the time in your show, audiology is changing so rapidly. And I think it has a lot to do with the influence of the onslaught of public health-based studies around hearing science that happened in the past decade or so. Yeah, we're starting to learn more for sure. Well, I re- there's a couple things here I want to touch on. One is I know that about maybe 2017, you wrote a paper, and the reason I know it well is because I have it with my slide decks where you compared a handful of PSAPs to a hearing aid and to the unaided condition. So you did research in that area, and now you seem over the last couple of years to be shifting into a, a, like pure policy, Medicare. Medicare, Medicaid benefits, those kinds of things. So maybe you can kind of explain that journey or that transition from one part of the field to the other. Yeah, I mean, I guess a part of it is um, natural progression of training, maybe. You know, when I started in uh, at Johns Hopkins, obviously I was coming from just a clinical standpoint. And the only thing informing me at a research level was what I had seen in the clinic. And the reason that we did that PSAP study um, was quite literally, uh, when I was at Georgetown University Hospital doing my fourth year, we would have people come in and they were at this sort of transition point in their lives where, you know, they were 26 and rolling off of their parents' insurance and needed to get, you know, another set of hearing aids to get them over the hump. Or they were just, you know, in their early thirties, late, you know, late twenties and, um, 
uh, they had, you, you know, they just happen to have progressive hearing loss. You know, you see a different population in the clinic than what you see in the, the general population and, or even, you know, early fifties. And they were not, you know, keen on getting a hearing aid because of cost barriers. And that came up over and over again. And, you know, I just happened to have the right kind of mentors at the time on the clinic side that we would do whatever we could to find somebody something. And this is, you know, this is the early stage of PSAPs. There's not a lot of options out there, but we looked through all of our, you know, everything in our tool bag and, you know, we found some things that were not that bad and we would basically connect people with them and then teach them to use them in very specific situations that they were having problems. And we would overcome their problems at the moment. I'm not saying that we solved all their problems for the long term, but it sort of spurred the question that if you create a rigorous design study where you're isolating the technology. Mm -hmm. Are the technologies relatively equivalent when it comes to, you know, big picture outcomes? We know at an electroacoustic level, not equivalent, but we also know from research that a lot of stuff that we do in the labs for, you know, processing and the electroacoustic differences, they don't translate to speech understanding differences and they don't translate to quality differences. We, we knew that from Robin Cox's work. So so we sort of sat down and did that work. And then you're absolutely right that we started to, ch- I've started to change. I'll, I'll be honest with you. It's very driven by personal stories where in 2018, one of my closest friends, he had von, Hipp- von Hippel-Lindau syndrome is essentially, he doesn't have the ability to suppress tumors. And he'd been dealing with this for a long time. Lung cancer, you know, had half a lung removed, had tumors in his spine, brain tumors. And it was coming to a point when his body couldn't handle it anymore. And this is a, you know... 36 year old at the time, cognitively normal. Um, He had a heart attack and ended up in the hospital. And when he was in the hospital and he was finally pulled back out of the ICU and he's in, you know, recovery and just a general medical inpatient unit. I drove up to Pittsburgh to see him and, you know, he just didn't make sense. Everything was, you know, off. He seemed withdrawn. He was not there. He was not with us. You know, he was with us, but not. Mm -hmm. And it just did not make sense. And it was actually his wife who pointed out to me that they had just told me not long before that, that he had tumors pushing up against his IACs and he basically had a conductive hearing loss. And well, actually probably sensory at that point, just depending on how big the tumor was, but you know what I mean? Mm. Hearing loss is present. And I had my lab in Baltimore actually overnight ship just the basic, you know, handheld amplifier. And we put it on him, and we saw him come back to us within a 28 or 48 hour period. Like He's, he was sharp as a tack again, able to make jokes, you know, despite his condition. And he wore that every single day, the rest of his life. And what I, after talking with some of my mentors at Hopkins, particularly in geriatrics, SRO at Hopkins, and then Sharon Inoue, who I later was connected with at Harvard, you know, it's classic delirium and, you know, delirium is not just something that happens to older adults. And it's also not just something that happens to adults with dementia, as we might think, or something like that. This is, you know, other pathways when we block communication in the clinic can cause this. And, you know, to me, I don't know, this was just an injustice on a level that I couldn't comprehend, especially Mm -hmm. when I think we know delirium is associated with worse health outcomes. And so for him to experience that, we are, we already knew he was in a hospice like situation, but you know, we may have extended those three months into six months who knows, or maybe Mm -hmm. a year. And when I think that we can study this area and do something about it, hospital-based interactions with hearing loss, it's very personal for me. And it's something that I've sort of dedicated now my research towards. And by happenstance, that also falls into the policy side of how we can make sure at a policy level, we're addressing hearing loss and we're getting people devices they need. So yeah, I think it's fair to characterize that I've sort of changed, maybe evolved, but you know, the truth is like a lot of people in life, it's personally driven for me. It's not, you know, I don't even know if there's more research money in one space or the other or something like that. Right. Right. It's become something you're keenly interested in. And I think the really interesting thing, or one of the interesting components of a lot of the work you do is you're interacting with uh, epidemiologists, other areas. I mean, I think of a lot of the studies you've co-authored with, um, Jennifer Deal, I uh, may have the name, An- Amber Willink. 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 Yeah. Uh, so, and I know that uh, Frank Lynn, I think he's the founder, for lack of a better term, for the Cochlear Center. So maybe yeah. explain uh, how that came into, into fruition. What are the goals of the Cochlear Center? How you all work together? It seems like a really dynamic place. Yeah, it it is. It's a it's a fantastic uh, entity. So the Cochlear Center is sort of it's it's born out of Franklin's research, I think, and he had already started to form this team 
of uh, Jennifer Deal, myself, Josh Betts from Biostatistics, Kerry Neiman, who's another otolaryngologist, mm-hmm. Adele Goman, who is a psychologist actually by training, but very much was looking at um, population level health. And uh, and then Amber came uh, sort of at the founding of the center as well. And, you know, I don't know the full background story, but essentially Cochlear from Australia, Cochlear, the company, I think that they had a really healthy view of how we needed to go and research from a public health standpoint. And they basically provided this private gift of $1 million a year over 10 years to Johns Hopkins, Bloomberg School of Public Health, and that funded the center. And our mission is, it's vast. We have different pillars of research where we're looking at population level associations between hearing loss and health health outcomes and healthy aging, really. We are really trying to focus and establish ways to talk about and understand hearing loss. So sort of public health intervention on the societal level of, you know, let's get beyond just saying there's mild, moderate, severe hearing loss and get into something that's meaningful for people to anchor against and, you know, take action on, you know, intervention level, we're thinking about like task sharing. And this is Carrie Neiman's Hears project. And then for me, it's addressing hearing loss in hospitals. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also becoming sort of a policy center where we don't have a lot of bias. And our goal is to make sure that we match the needs of the healthcare system, as well as audiology, um, the manufacturers of the world, but you know, the hearing care space and create policy that works for the pu- the the public. I mean, in the end, that's our goal is to make sure that everybody has access to hearing care via major policy initiatives in the United States. And so the center has been uh, extremely fruitful, I think, in the researchers brought in over the years. Esther O, who's from Jerry, she's a geriatrician at Johns Hopkins, has become a core faculty member. Bonnie Sweenor, who is an expert in disability and particularly vision, um, has become a core faculty member. I think those are the two major additions in the past years. But we've also trained two PhD students have graduated. We have, I think, two currently studying a dozen or so master's students at this point. Yeah, we we really pride ourselves on providing scholarship to bridge the gaps where most of our students are public health students who we have them focus on hearing loss. We also bring in audiologists who we then train into public health. Um, and we've done that a few times and, uh, and physicians who we train into, you know, otolaryngology students who we train into public health. And so we sort of run the gamut in that space of just trying to break down that silo. And I guess, I guess what really does make it unique too is, um, we're focused on age-related hearing loss only. And we don't focus on cochlear implants, despite the name being named after cochlear. We don't, we don't touch cochlear implant research really. Right. Um, No, it's really interesting. I know one of the things that resonated with me that I think I heard from Frank Lind years ago was that we focus on infants or uh, not infants, but children and language development. And it's such a big deal for obvious reasons that you want to treat that loss early. When an adult has hearing loss, we just sort of make a joke about it. You know, it's normal for your age, deal with it. And that's, you know, a wrong assumption. And I think a lot of the work that you guys are doing is changing the mindset, not only of professionals, but also of the public, which is a great yeah. thing. I, yeah, I can't, I can't agree with you more. I, um, I, there's an interesting tidbit too at, at Johns Hopkins in particular. Uh, the School of Public Health actually had a center focused on hearing in the 70s, and it was uh, only pediatric hearing loss, right? And mm-hmm. it makes perfect sense because that's the area we cared about. And then mm-hmm. once those questions, I'm not saying they're all answered, but you know, audiology to their credit, audiology has done a great job. Yeah. We've reached a consensus on it for sure. We've, I mean, we've, you know, audiology actually deserves a pat on the back. We, we actually, from a public health standpoint have done phenomenal things. Mm -hmm. Universal newborn hearing screening is a gold standard for among public health of some, an intervention that occurred in the United States driven by audiology. I remember in the nineties when audiologists fought for that, right? Yeah. And you know, it's, it's wild to me that I'm not, again, we haven't answered all the questions, but then like the research from a public health standpoint starts to kind of just wane off after we, after in the seventies, eighties, uh, you know, parts of the nineties, we, we really hit this like Zenith of public health audiology research in, in the pediatric area. And then it starts to wane off. And now I see, I think we're seeing like a second wave where we're focusing on aging now. And, you know, perhaps it's a uh, sort of like you just mentioned, perhaps it's just sort of a justice issue too, where, unfortunately we, we ignored hearing loss in older adults, not audiology, but as a society for too right. long. And now we're seeing the interest there. Well, I think a lot of it's driven by the baby boomer generation. There's just so many of them and they're very vocal and proactive about things. And so it's bound to happen. It's a good thing. Uh, yeah. So you've used this term population-based health a few times, public health. And I think 
as a clinician, you know, for 25 years or so seeing patients on the individual level, I think it's sometimes hard to kind of wrap your head around what it means or how do you focus on population-based health and why, why is that important when I'm seeing dozens of individuals every week in my clinic? So what, what do audiologists need to know about public health or population-based health to make them more effective in the clinic? Mm, that's a good question. I think, so, <laughs> you know, without trying to like use terms in the title, but you know, public health is, is looking at health at a population level. It's, it's, and there's some fundamental differences here. We, I sort of, I said this earlier too, you get this idea that you can see trends at a population level that you can't necessarily see in the individual, right? And they're hard to tease out in the individual where you may see somebody who has hearing loss and you know, dementia, and you, you don't really put two and two together that they might be related. But then when you look at many, many individuals, we can pull out that association. And what's important about that association though, those numbers that we see, and this is, this is something that literally everybody gets wrong. The estimate of risk is at the population level. So when you see numbers like, you know, like the big Lancet analysis, 9% of dementia is attributable to hearing loss. It's not that in, an, in a given individual, like 9% of dementia is attributable to hearing loss or that like they have a 9% increased risk or something like that. It's that if you wiped out hearing loss on the global scale, 9% of dementia would also disappear, right? So the same thing for all these studies you see where you know, hearing loss uh, contributed to five times the odds to develop dementia or you know a 36% higher risk of dementia. None of that is individual. So right. when you're looking at that research as an audiologist, it's always important to keep that in the back of your mind that we create the associations at a population level, but we treat the individual, right? And so there is increased risk at a macro level, but it doesn't necessarily create like a one-to-one, -one, right? And right. I, think, I think that's hard actually to, to do that. You hear these numbers thrown around and it's so much easier to just say like, oh yeah, twice the risk. Right? That's yeah, it. no, I know. And I, I think, and I really want to, if we can maybe dig at this point a little bit, because I think I see this all the time in, in marketing material, you know, audiologists, hearing care professionals want to do the right thing and they want to use data to make a claim or in marketing. But I think it's almost, it's an apples and oranges thing because to your point, these studies, the, the beauty of these studies is they're having the data points from thousands of people. So you get some really powerful analytics, but they may not apply to the individual. So I guess, how do you navigate that as a clinician? How do you, how do you, talk to the data, speak to the data when you have an individual in front of you in the clinic, or you're developing a marketing piece, how do you do it in an accurate, responsible, ethical way? Yeah. I mean, so when, when trying to, you know, put that data out there, I think it is completely ethical to cite and, you know, talk about the data. I think where mm -hmm. it becomes unethical is when we use it. And, you know, I'm not saying people do this, but uh, inadvertently we use it like as a scare tactic. Like we're almost saying, you know, you have hearing loss, then you're increased risk for dementia. It's not, not necessarily right. true. Right. Instead, I think it's like healthy to think about it as, you know, almost like talking about heart disease or obesity, think other areas of public health that we've done a lot of work in. You know, we, we talk about soda consumption, for example, increases risk, you know, smoking increases risk, eating red meat increases risks. But we also know that, you know, one sandwich of, you know, cured meats, one, one steak, one soda, you know, I don't, I don't want to I'm not telling anyone to go smoke a cigarette, but one cigarette necessarily, like we know that there's sort of accumulation of these items that increase risk. And just because one person does something does not always mean that that individual is going to do something. And maybe, maybe people can resonate with that a little bit easier. Just because you have hearing loss does not mean you will develop dementia. Um, and again, population level, absolutely. Sure. We, we can measure that, but we don't have the individual level risk. And it doesn't mean like I, people want to know, they want you to say like, okay, I have hearing loss. What does that mean for me? And I think your job as a clinician is more to say, well, at a population level, there's an association between the two. And that would mean that you are at higher risk as well. But it doesn't mean that you have some set number at this point where, okay, you have hearing loss, you're at 50% higher risk. You're, you're a complete person and all these different things go into it and matter. And so it's all about living a healthy lifestyle overall, because mm -hmm. for that given individual, you know, the hearing loss could be completely counteracted. And then I also think it's important audiologists always dig into what we think the mechanistic pathways are. And if we think it has a lot to do with social isolation and loneliness, for example, then 
we need to remind people that that is part of the mechanism we see there. It's not just that hearing loss creates this out of thin air. There's a pathway. And so we want to make sure that, you know, you as an individual are staying active and getting out there. And this is, this is fundamental to humans. You know, you can always talk about, I think all people resonate with this. Like we are creatures that love our species, right? We are, we like to be in groups. We need that interaction. We crave at a societal level interaction. Right. Right. I think people get that. Yeah, no, and I think that's a great point about you're increasing the odds are maybe a little bit greater because you're doing these things, but at the individual level, there's too many other variables to know for sure. So, but you've already mentioned social social isolation, loneliness. I know that you and your colleagues there have done an awful lot of you've done literature reviews, you've done studies that look at the association between some of these other conditions and how they're related to hearing loss. So maybe we can kind of Take a look at some of them, social isolation and loneliness. Maybe what's the difference between those two concepts? How do they relate to hearing loss? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's actually a great question. Most people just use those interchangeably. Social isolation really is the way I sort of think of it at a very lay level, right? Mm-hmm. Social isolation is a you know objective measure of how many people you've interacted with. Loneliness is your perception of how lonely you are. So it is very possible to interact with dozens of people and still be lonely, right? Your social isolation could be, you know, quote unquote, normal, no different than anyone else, but you could still be lonely. Yeah. It's Uh, like your emotional reaction to it. Yeah. Yeah. You could think of it that way. Absolutely. And so they are different concepts. They correlate a hundred, like they, they do have a strong correlation. So, you know, Mm -hmm. the, but they are fundamentally different. We have, uh, like you said, there's been a ton of research in this area, I think lately, and I still actually will say there's not enough. A, a social isolation and loneliness are also those kind of areas that they've got they've got good public health attention, but at the same time, they've also sort of been ignored among older adults, just like, you know, just like hearing loss. You know, there's I, there's sort of an ageism in research in that we haven't treated adults with the same sort of justice that I think we've given towards other uh, older adults, towards other groups, just adults, pediatrics, adolescents. And we've sort of ignored them thinking like, oh, well, that's just, that's age. You're just getting older and that's it. But this is a part of it. AARP did this huge report that Charlotte Yeh, the chief medical officer, will talk about where social isolation and loneliness actually are the highest predictors of uh, morbidity and mortality among older adults. And they cost more per year to Medicare than anything else. Really? Um, so they're incredibly mm-hmm. important. And for us as audiologists, I think this becomes important because this is a pathway. Hearing loss increases risk. And so that's the area, risk for social isolation and loneliness. And that's the area that people have started studying. The data is, it's not great at a macro level. And to be honest, this has to do with a lack of good data. And what I mean by that is a lot of the studies out there that associate one with the other are using measures of self-report, for example. And you can imagine there's sort of a measurement, there's sort of a bias in that kind of approach in that if you're lonely, you may be more or less likely depending to report accurately your hearing loss, right? Just like with depression and dementia and hearing loss, the association, the, the exposure measure in that sense matters. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those areas where it's important that we get, you know, quote unquote, objective measures. And I say that because we know that pure tones are not objective. They're a behavioral measure still, but something that at a population level is much more clinically gold standard measure. And whether it's pure tones, whether it's speech and noise measures, whether it's a a better questionnaire that can sort of tease apart, just like a yes, no, I have hearing loss type question, Mm -hmm. whatever it is, you know, I'm not saying there's a there's a gold standard, but the the main thing I think is that we need better measures to then associate with these because then we can do a better job of estimating the actual risk change. But to that point, at a macro level, if you look at the meta analyses that we've done or the systematic reviews, our big thing was looking at the UCLA loneliness scale and seeing how many studies uh, had used it and looked with hearing loss. And when we aligned it at a meta analysis level, I think I think we identified like nine studies. You know, essentially we found that there was a lot of homogeneity and agreement between all of the studies, and there is an you know increased risk in the presence of hearing loss. Um, you know, so it's more loss. likely. Yeah. On the population level, if a person is hearing loss, that they're going to be socially isolated and lonely. Yeah. Loneliness was easier for us to find. Social isolation, almost non-existent in the literature um, okay. because it's a lot harder to get somebody to tell you how many people they've interacted with lately. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. Well, and I know um, 
I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the it's a, I think it's about 10 years old now, the study that looked at the relationship between uh, cognitive decline and hearing loss and the dosage effect. You can maybe, you know, like you're at much h- higher odds of, of having, of requiring dementia or mm-hmm. having cognitive decline, however you want to describe it. I'll let you do that. Um, if you had a, a more significant hearing loss relative to a mild loss. And I also know that there's work now, in the Justin Golob, subclinical mm-hmm. hearing loss. So maybe you could speak to how that all fits together. Yeah, yeah. So I know exactly which study you're talking about, the dose response one that we mm-hmm. often talk about. It's um, Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging. It's uh, Franklin's work. And essentially he looked, uh, it's survival analysis in a sense that at baseline, nobody has dementia. And then we look forward in time and we look at you know risk of developing dementia for each individual. And then we look by hearing level. And so when you, when you, do it that way. You use the World Health Organization categories for frequency P- PTA. Those with mild hearing loss have twice the you, it's it's hazard ratio, but you can interpret it as odds, basically twice the odds. And then uh, those with mild have three times the odds. And then those with severe or sorry, moderate three times the odds. And then severe was actually five times the odds. But you know. I also put a little bit of caution on that because there's not a lot of adults with severe hearing loss in that study. So the the precision of that estimate is wide and that the confidence interval was really wide. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I do think though that the the moderate with three times the odds is even the mild with two times that's nothing to sneeze at. I mean, people people don't know how to interpret odds. And that's because odds are sort of uninterpretable. Risk is a better way to think of things because then we can say like with precision that like, you know, 23% risk equates to a a very specific thing. Whereas odds are sort of, you know, relative, it's all relative and it's harder to get. But, you know, in epidemiologic literature, when you get any time over like 20% odds, so, and you're, and in this case, we're looking at a hundred and 300% odds. We are well into like, you know, significant clinically meaningful areas. Like these are big numbers. Um, and then Justin's work. Oh, that's, so I love Justin's work. I really like Justin Golub, um, Columbia at Columbia. And he has been focusing on, okay, so if you look at, you know, we see this dose response in all these other studies, right? And a lot of the work that, that Franklin has done, for example, and Jennifer, they've looked at continuous measures of PTA as well. And, and we always see, you know, that, you know, we see these dose responses essentially where the, the higher your hearing loss the, the more uh, various different outcomes, the worse things are, the higher the risk for the outcome. Justin looked at those under four frequency PTA of 25 and saw an association with cognition and subclinical hearing loss. And essentially now you're saying that, okay, we, we stratified to this group of quote unquote normal hearing, and we still see the higher your PTA within that group, the, the more likely to have you know, poorer cognition uh, based off. I can't remember the measure he used. I think he used the N Haynes data. So it might've been digit symbol substitution. I I don't quote me on that, but uh, the paper is in JAMA otolaryngology for anyone who wants to read it. And I think it just gets at this idea that, you know, maybe this is a little philosophical, but, you know, perhaps we don't have perfect cut points for hearing loss. And also just, this is the difference between clinical and epidemiologic work where at the epidemiologic level, we have to define hearing somehow. And we use the four frequency pure tone average. And that's pretty standard. But mm-hmm. at the clinical level, you know, we know that you you might not have a uh, PTA that goes over 25, but you might still have clinical complaints of hearing because you have more hearing loss over, you know, four, six, eight thousand le- frequency levels, right? Or you know, perhaps there's something here where we need to think more about where somebody's, you know, original baseline is and where they've moved from there. Yeah, exactly. It's a huge range, right? Yeah. If you, you know, if you start at a PTA of negative five and you move to 20 versus uh, somebody who was, you know, around like a 20 that moved to a 25, well, we label one person with hearing loss and we call the other normal still, despite over their life course having a massive change. Yeah, they dropped. And so this could be part of, you know, I think, I think what Justin's work is sort of telling us is that probably the same pathways exist, things like cognitive load, things like sensory changes uh, to the uh, causing structural sensory input, causing structural changes to the brain, and then perhaps even communication causing social isolation and loneliness uh, to get to cognitive decline. But, you know, it may not just be a phenomenon of these arbitrary measures of hearing loss. It, it, it really might be more important to think about PTA as a continuous thing and any individual change, any, you know, loss at any level could be, you know, right. Is important. Well, a couple of things. I think that uh, 
he also has a paper that looks at um, subclinical hearing loss and depression. So there's more than just cognitive decline going on. But I think the point I also wanted to make here is as a clinician, you can't just look at somebody's thresholds and make a determination about intervention. You need some other tool like a uh, you know, some type of a scale self-report that's validated to help you determine. I mean, I can think of all kinds of people that I've seen over the years that had to do a case history and you think the person is a, you know, a, a hearing aid candidate, you put them in the booth to do the test, you find out they have normal hearing and then you're kind of stuck. But, you know, if you did it, you took it a step further, you could, uh, you know, by doing some type of a scale like the HHIE, you could determine what their auditory wellness is. I think the gap is we don't have real solid intervention strategies beyond stay out of the background noise, you know, find the least reverberant place in the restaurant. There are, I think that things are changing though. I think you're going to start to see more things come to the table at devices that help. I wholeheartedly agree with you. I think that we are seeing a real, like the tool belt is expanding drastically, Mm -hmm. very, very rapidly. And um, yeah, I think that's the perfect way to think about it too. And that, you know, there's a way to measure peripheral hearing loss. And that's what we're using in a lot of these epidemiologic studies. But there's a way to actually measure, you know, difficulties associated with hearing that translates more toward the idea of intervention than just the, the peripheral side, right? Right. And it's it's an important distinction to make. It's, you know, we, this, this gets at too, you know, again, philosophically, like we talk about these things and they don't make any sense to the public. And we've, we've got to do a better job of, you know, this is hearing, right? This is hearing over here, but this is your difficulty. And this is what translates to the hearing aid side, right? And this is where, or hearing aid intervention in general, like this is where you got to do something perhaps. And, you know, it goes back to what you asked in the beginning, actually, public health versus the way you treat the individual. 